Okay, so let's move on to our final scenario. And the question is, what is your dream scenario of Asian American cultural production in five to 10 years? Or what is your dream project in the next five to 10 years, right? So I, I'm hoping five to 10 years gives you something sort of practical uh, <laughs> limit, right? So uh, Tiffany, please begin. Yeah, I mean, I think the first one's a really big question. What do I want for Asian American culture production? I want Asian American voices to not have to be called uh, world music anymore, you know? <laughs> you guys all were like, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I would love for that to happen. Um, but, you know, I can, I can probably speak better to what I want my dream project to be within the next decade. I would love to be able to create a kind of like short film style music video um, collection for like an album, kind of like how Beyonce did for what was that like lemonade where it's it's this storytelling through the music but in this kind of cinematographic i don't know how to talk right now but you know it's like it's short film style um the way that it's shot so i would love to do something like that for my full album that's also incorporating uh some theatrical elements and like just showing that Cambodian American bodies don't only have to perform preservationist work, that we can be in this kind of like pop culture, hegemonic um, conversation about cultural production and that our stories matter. And so, you know, I think that'll take a lot of funding, <laughs> but I'm definitely, I'm definitely hoping that I can build a team that can, um, accomplish a goal like this for at least, you know, a, a side project for, for me to be doing. I think that would be super fun. Great. Thank you. Kim. Um, I, in the next five or 10 years or so, um, I would love it if there was more uh, Asian American cultural production that um, um, encourage solidarity between Asian Americans and other ethnic groups. Um, I think that this current situation with COVID-19 um, has probably caused some Asian Americans to experience for the first time what a lot of um, people in the Black community have experienced for a very, very long time, um, which is feeling, um, you know, uncomfortable, unsafe, um, fearful of maybe being, um, you know, attacked or um, having some sort of violence or hatred directed towards you um, for simply existing in public spaces, right? Um, and I, I think um, as unfortunate as that, um, you know, these increases in, in those occurrences um, is, um, I think that it can be a point um, for um, furthering understanding and empathy between communities. Um, so I'm hoping that, um, you know, maybe some sort of silver lining in all of this is that um, there can be a little bit more solidarity um, between the Black and Asian communities, but also um, the Latinx community um, and uh, kind of organizing around immigration policies. I think there's a lot of potential for, for Asian Americans to be involved in that. Um, there's a lot more undocumented Asian Americans than people realize, I think. I think the stat was like 1.7 million for um, 2017. There's like a, a pretty large um, population of un undocumented Asians. And then the, the Southeast Asian American community as well um, um, is facing um, deportations. Uh, a lot of the, some of the refugee community members are, are um, facing deportations for, for um, sometimes nonviolent um, minor crimes that were committed as minors. Um, but now because of that, they're, they're facing kind of final deportation orders at this time. Um, so I would love to see how the arts um, and music can um, help to encourage different social movements and um, um, encourage um, interactions and, and cultural understanding between ethnic groups. Okay, thank you so much. Joe. I think actually that I want that. Um, I also feel like what my original 
answer for this was might play into that and it's sustainability. I want there to be sustainability for Asian American artists. I want there to be sustainability for pretty much everyone who who do not have, does not have sustainability right now. And that's, I think for artists, not that all artists, I mean, starving artists is a thing, so it's not always sustainable, but you sustain it because you love the art. But I do feel like we have these peaks of, oh, great, um, number one movie we have, whatever, Crazy Rich Asian, and then Bruno Mars wins. And if you count Bruno Mars as an Asian American artist, uh, Bruno Mars wins a Grammy, but that's a peak and it might just fall right back down and there's no sustainability to it. I think it'd be better if like Jay Som is on her seventh album in 10 years and she's still producing work and people are still supporting her. I'm pretty sure she would be and all these other artists out there. And on the other end of it is I do, even as somebody who, who is fully in support of Asian American film festivals and Asian American work being in a band that literally put Asian American as one of the headlines, um, I do think it's important for the work to stand on its own. And that is also going to create a more balanced playing field because I feel like, yeah, like we shouldn't be fighting over the resources that's there. We should all be able to create the art that we want to create. And every one of us can share the resources that's available and make the strongest art possible. And then I'm assuming if it's a balanced world, then you can be Asian American, you can be Latinx, you can be black, and you should still have access to all the resources and still create the work that you want to create. Thank you. Uh, Trisha. I mean, what they all said. <laughs> um, but I just want to piggyback on a little bit of what everybody has said. And I feel like um, to kind of continue the thread, I feel like some of my, yeah, yeah I, I was quite overwhelmed by this question because I was like, oh my gosh, like so many things. <laughs> but I will say that even in talking today, I, I'm feeling a little anxiety, like a little bit of a vulnerability hangover and feeling slightly unsafe about sharing the stories that I've told. I would like a world where that doesn't happen, where I can tell those stories and not be worried about recrimination, not be worried about being told that my experiences aren't valid, that they don't exist. And alternatively, sort of to what Joe is saying too, like I think that there is like, as you were saying, Tiffany, there's this tokenism still that's still is so like rampant. And so one of the books that's come out recently that I think is so important is by Kathy Park Hong called Minor Feelings. Um, I don't know if you haven't read it, you should read something. She's an extraordinary poet, but this is a book of essays. And I remember feeling so torn as I was reading this book, like so admiring and so validated by it, but also feeling like, oh, there isn't space for me now because here's this Korean writer who's written these wonderful things and written these extraordinary essays. What, what can I possibly have to contribute? And the fact that I feel that is, I think, um, indicative of the system that we're in. Like publishers still to date, they want their one Asian writer or their one South Asian writer, and they want them to, you know, write in a certain vernacular and look a certain way and, you know, come out of a certain workshop model. So my hope is that that not only will there be space for all of us, but there'll be space for all of us to be different from each other. And like Joe was saying that we won't be evaluated as like an Asian, Asian writer, Asian artist, Asian American, whatever, but just an artist saying whatever it is we need to say. And I think um, I really, I very much resonated with what Kim said about the power of the arts to fill in the gaps. Like, I think that, um, and the solidarity we can find with each other so that we can like, um, create again sort of coalitions and to stop because we are monolithic like we are huge like there's no you know what I mean that just sheer numbers is like you can't you can't deny that the problem is that we are we are erased within those numbers that we are somehow faceless and voiceless and we are only given like one spot at the table um, and that's where like I am now anxious about the things I said and worried about there not being space and I haven't done enough and there's this constant anxiety about like I haven't done what I need to do fast enough, but I also feel unsafe doing it. So my hope is that that it's already so much better than you know when I was in high school when I was a little kid I think there is so much. Um, reason to be hopeful. And thank you, Eric, for putting this together, because this is a really big part of what's making this possible for us to find spaces where we can have conversations like this and be really frank and voice some of the needs that we have so that we can all um, have our own fair shot at representation and saying what we need to say. So thank you very much. And that is part of the point of doing this. You know, we have 
12 people um, in over three weeks, you know, um, talking about similar issues and, you know, certain themes will come up and I completely understand the vulnerability and, um, you know, hopefully there's, there's power in numbers, even though our numbers are small, 12 is small, but, <laughs> but at least, you know, we'll, we'll, you're not alone in, in telling these stories. Okay, so we have about five or six minutes uh, for thoughts, reflections. Um, yeah, all up to you. Tiffany, please go. Man, ahead. going first on that last question sucked because you guys all had such great answers. So uh, did you. What are you talking about? <laughs> Whatever. I mean, those are all of the things that you guys brought up are real things that I think about a lot. And I'm so happy that, you know, we we're able to like, bring these conversations out. So thank you so much, Eric, for, for this space to do that. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I want to respond to what Joe was saying earlier about wanting our work to be able to stand on its own, right? We need to make sure that our communities are um, being invested in. You know, we need to make sure that, especially with the arts and with music, I grew up not having really great access to um, any kind of creative arts training, except for the fact that I'm probably gonna get in trouble for saying this. We used my grandma's address as my address to get me into a performing arts elementary school. <laughs> I mean, sorry, mom, but like, I, whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was the first time where I was like, oh, singing and dancing, like, that's, that's a thing that, that we can do. And it's, and because before, it, the only exposure I really had to doing um, artwork was preservationist work, which was community driven. The community came together to, you know, get a Cambodian classical dance teacher to teach us. Sometimes it was just like a teenager that was trained by someone else. Um, and sometimes we were able to have a real instructor that was very low or unpaid in order to do these things. So, you know, it's no surprise that our communities aren't always given the resources to um, be great artists. You know, and so I'm really hoping that we find ways to invest in our community's education surrounding the arts. You're muted, Eric. <laughs> I'm not muted. I'll talk. Mansplain time. Um, no, I, I, yeah, that every, everything you just said, I, I was going to say another thing with the, the standing work standing on its own. I think it takes time for any, any artist to really have legs to stand on their own. And yeah, that support, or just in general, like there's a collective support that happens. You can be Van Gogh and be kind of crazy and live in a thing. Somebody has to house you. Somebody has to keep you alive until you decide to end it. Um, but to me, it's like, that's what we needed a lot of times. Yeah, like I, I grew up and did not have the uh, resources. I did, instead of, you know, I definitely went off tracks. My mom probably would have much preferred me not to do any of this, <laughs> this the current career path. Um, but I had to kind of be a little off in the head to even pick like, oh, I'm gonna start playing music now. I'm gonna do that for like 10 years before I even play a show, but I'm gonna do that. And I don't think I had the influence to be like, I should start a band. I should do, I should learn music business. I might have a shot at doing this. And so to, to actually have representation, to actually have people who succeed, it's so important to, to see that. And yeah, I, I do now feel like I should have had more, maybe I tried a little harder, represented a little more, but then also seen more along the way. But anyways, I do think it's important to have the representation and from there make the work so good that we don't need to be defined by our race and we just do the work yeah. yeah and i think more so we can even um create collaborations between different artists of color in order to um build these bridges that you know kim was talking about between and these and this solidarity between our communities so 
a lot of my work on my album is collaborative work done with my between myself and African American amazing musicians who we sat down and talked extensively about Asian American stories, about Black stories, about our experiences, about, you know, Cambodian American stories and why I was making this record. So it's really through um, pieces like this and through these kinds of collaborations where we're able to sit down, not only create really good creative work, but to share stories with one another that can just really help build some kind of connection and solidarity and and these like empathy channels between communities right because now the people that I play with um they know about Cambodian Americans they know that there was a genocide you know and they tell me about their stories and and it's so just um, empowering to be, to have come from a space where we were all sitting together telling stories and making music. You know, I, I really hope that more musicians are having experiences like these. Right, and then there's a, I mean, we should recognize a really, really long history of um, Afro-Asian collaborations and um, Asian Latinx um, collaborations going, you know, back, you know, we, if you read Vivek Bald's book, uh, Bengali Harlem, Harlem, talking about, you know, essentially black families taking in these Indian merchants who were coming to, to the US around 1900, um, and obviously Asian American jazz, but, but part of the story is also, I mean, of course, the Lano grape strike as well, certainly. And, but part of the issue here is how hard these collaborations are to sustain, right? And, and every generation feels like, we have to start again with these um, cross-racial collaborations because the forces that keep the races separate are so strong. Uh, and it's, it's, yeah, so I think, you know, yes, absolutely, we need to do this work. Uh, at the same time, we, we should recognize history of this, you know, we're, we're not the first people to, <laughs> to do this work. Um, Kim, you haven't said anything. Do you want to say anything? You don't have to. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Eric, for organizing everything. And I'm so happy to just meet you all and get connected to you all. And I would love it if we stayed in contact and if you could keep me updated on, um, you know, just what you're up to and, uh, yeah, just stay, stay connected. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for participating uh, in this First, first. This is the first virtual thing that we have tried as 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 a mark event. We have all we have done things in person, but we have actually never. We have done like conference presentations virtually, but we haven't organized anything virtually. So this, thank you for being our our guinea pigs for this. So, um, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, Trisha. Thank you, Mandy, for for looking at the Facebook feed. <laughs> and, <laughs> is it still a black screen? Is it a black Okay, all right. Oh. <laughs> Trisha, Trisha, your space looks like a movie set now. Like the lighting. I know, I have this like changed. amazing, uh, it's this, it's, I really don't like the color of these walls. Yeah. It's not up to me, but it does do like a nice lighting thing on Zoom. <laughs> yeah, no, YouTube, YouTube your podcast. I should, right? Yeah. Video that shit. Oh, sorry. Did I just ruin it by cursing? Oh, no. You could have been cursing this whole time. Oh, no. <laughs> I broke it. Is your mom watching? <laughs> sorry, yeah. mom. I love you. <laughs> so next week, we're going to have um, Lauren Kachikawa, who is a musicologist specializing in hip hop. Uh, Amanda Su, who is an orchestra conductor in Texas. Uh, ben Kano, who is a woodwinds player, mostly in jazz, but in other genres as well. And Zain Alam, who is a singer-songwriter slash filmmaker, um, uh, who's currently, I think, um, I mean, he was at Harvard last year, but I think um, now based in New York. So uh, I hope we will see everyone again next week. And thank you again to Joe and to Kim and to Tiffany and to Trisha. Thank you, Eric. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.